In today's video, you're going to get an up and close personal look at one of the coolest spindexers that I have seen all FTC decode season. I'm Coach Pratt, and I've been teaching robotics design for over a decade now, and I've led SDC teams to winning national championships. And today I sat down with Team 23240, the Shooting Stars from Texas, and to talk about their robot. We're going to go through their strategy, how they bring rope balls into it, how they rotate the spindex around, and then how they're able to launch balls super accurately. But at the end of the day, I hope you'll be inspired and have a better understanding of how you might approach doing some indexing this FTC season. So tell me about your general strategy for the season. What's your approach to the code? So this season, we wanted to be able to do everything on the field because in the past, we we're good at like select things and we weren't as strong for the rest, which kind of had an impact on like how the rest of our season went. So this season we wanted to be able to sort, we wanted to be able to decently fast score and we wanted to be able to park with another robot. Like Gunther said, we wanted to be able to do everything. Sorting was a big factor in that. So going into our robot, we knew we wanted to have a way to sort. Yeah, and that sorting thing you guys have come up with is super cool. So let's talk about, and I'm pretty excited to be able to get a like a, a closer look inside of it as well. Let's uh, talk first about your intake. How does that ball get into that sorter before we actually get to that uh, index? So our intake is a rubber band spindle that's powered by an, um, an 1150 RPM go build a motor. And how it works is the artifact just like when it spins, the artifact just comes here and our spindexer moves down using the go build a go rails and, uh, and a two bar linkage powered by an axon servo. And so the rubber band spindle just rolls and then the ball rolls into the spindexer. Hmm. Okay, so that intake is actually kind of a bit of a two parter almost. Or I guess the intake itself is a two-parter. It's more that the that you've got a two-part transfer and spindexing in the same kind of location, but the intake is all kind of solid. And it also looks like on your intake you have a couple, three printed small little angles. Is that to try to feed the artifact in easier as well? Yes. Cool. Awesome. So let's talk about that spindexer then, because it's kind of both the uh, the transfer and the indexing. How does that work? You were saying you've got some go build to go reels going on the side there, and then the whole thing lifts up and down. You've got a few different axon servos. There's there's a lot to unpack <laughs> in your design. Yeah. So basically, how it works is that so this ax axon servo right here spins the spindexer, and then this one over here moves it up and down using this two bar linkage over here and it just rolls on the go rails and so to intake so we have two positions on in on the spindexer the first is when it's down to intake and then the second is when it's like it's up and that's to feed artifacts into the shooter this the up and down movement is also counter sprung so that it's faster. So there's not um, as much uh, weight on your axon server to be able to lift that thing up and down. Yeah. Yes. So we actually have we actually have like one of the spindexers right here. So as you notice, we have square shaped chambers that are quite large, and this is so that the when we're intaking it actually takes up the whole space for the intake on the robot so we have a lot of compliance when intaking artifacts and then we also have a so then how the ball is like transfer from the spindexer to the shooter is that each chamber is slanted at the bottom here so it just rolls off the spindexer and into the shooter so the ball actually flips over itself to then be able to let's let's yeah. take a look at that that swap because I don't know if it's perfectly clear that it flips over itself. So how exactly does that come to be? So originally it starts in the down position for intake, as you saw earlier. But 
the way the shader is placed, it, the uh, spin texture has to spin completely, and it has to be at sort of a one and a half position. Um, mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we have this trigger servo or this trigger lever here that's powered by a speed servo. And when when we don't want the ball in the shooter, it also acts as a sort of block to keep the ball mm -hmm. out and can continue spinning. And then when we want to drop it, it lowers, and the ramp that was like previously mentioned will then allow the ball to roll down into mm -hmm. the shooter. And then, so it's just a little gravity feed to be able to roll that yeah. down. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Any reliability issues on that kind of gravity rolling into your shooter? No. Not on the not on it rolling into the shooter. Okay. Cool. And then uh, the the sides are also quite open as this thing is rotating around. Yeah. Does the ball jostle around inside as it's spinning, or is it there's enough spinning force that it tends to hold itself in where it needs to be? No, it doesn't normally jostle much because also along with that, we also have a, a box around it normally. Mm -hmm. So there's not much like it, it doesn't have the ability to move much. Very mm -hmm. much. Very cool. Oh. Very cool. And it looks like you've got you're powering that off of a positional servo. Then you're just saying it to go to specific angles uh, yes. as it goes around. Cool. Yeah. And then I've also seen some lights on the inside of those corners. It looks like you have some. Uh, 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 color sensors in the edges of those as yeah. well. How is that we working have, for you? We have three color sensors, so one in each corner of each bendexer, and they they work really well. So we use we use the color sensors as proximity sensors as well to make sure that depending on how close or far the ball is inside of it, um, inside of each chamber, because as Anishka says. It does move around inside of the chamber. It makes sure that even if it's farther and the RGB values change, that the color sensor still identifies that there is a ball. It identifies the color of the ball. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then do you make it easy for your driver? Do you have like, you know, the B button is always firing purple, the A button's always firing green or things like that. How do you make it easy for your drivers? Yes, so we have a button for just purple, one for just green, and one to shoot all three in just the order of a chamber. So one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're in the, you're not in last, you know, minute forty seconds. It doesn't really matter what order they're going, and you can just bing, 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 all three of them fire up, and you have one that will just fire specific colors, so you can actually get yourself into an indexing as well. Yeah, and you're yeah. saying, I know that we see that in the matches, you have this big kind of shroud on. Do you find that also helps make your color sensor a lot more reliable as well? It keeps Oops. consistent lighting inside the box, which allows the color sensor to be more accurate. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now let's talk about your outtake. How does your uh, flywheel work? What is your setup there? Okay. So we have, we're using two 6,000 RPM Go Build a Motors and then the Go build a gecko wheels, the 96 mm gecko wheels. And then we also have this go build a speed servo that's like a trigger lever. So after the ball rolls into this area, the trigger level lever will then move up, allowing the, and the, until like the ball touches the wheels, allowing the ball to shoot. Mm -hmm. We also have this turntable so, to um, move the angle. Yes, so for the turntable, we use our limelight to get the TX value, which we add to the turntable servo to correct for the angle. And we also use the limelight to get the distance using, and we actually use the distance function that you use in, that you gave us in your video. But we, you, we use the distance function to get what the RPM has to be, depending on how close or far we are from the goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's going to be absolutely critical for teams this season. I'm sure you probably found your drivers, as they're moving around, it's really challenging to angle a turret to be able to look at what you need, whereas that is, if that's automatically happening, it just makes life so much simpler, right? Do you find, now you're geared down quite a bit on that turntable. Do you find that that, is, that has a, a quick enough rotation speed for you able to face towards that April tag? Yes, so the turntable doesn't really need to move all that much because the driver's already facing in like the general area so it doesn't move too much so the speed's normally pretty um good cool 
Awesome. And then let's talk a little bit about Endgame. Do you have any sort of basing plans for trying to get two robots on a base? Yes, yeah, so we have a we have a servo that powers a linear screwdrive right here, which allows the robot to tilt. And then that allows us to park in around 11 inches. Right now, we're trying to get the weight balance so that instead of tilting backwards, it tilts forward, and that will allow us to park in around six and a half inches. I can show you that one. So just a little uh, linear actuator on a lead screw, is that the idea? Yeah. And it looks like you've got... Oh, glad the camera wasn't uh, stuck in there as that thing <laughs> initialized. <laughs> It looks like you've got little Omni wheels on there as well as it pivots up. Yeah. So the hope was that once it tilts, the Omni mm -hmm. wheels will allow us to like fine tune the position to make sure we're completely inside the box. Mm -hmm. But again, we're balancing the weight because right now on the on the foam tiles, it actually like yeah. presses in so it can't move. Yeah. And as you can see, yeah. we're trying to like tilt because it only needs a little force to tilt over this way. Mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. So where can you put that battery? Where can you take things off? Can you put yeah. a ballast on somewhere without really affecting things too much, right? Like how far out can you, it looks like you've got a battery right there on the very far edge of where you can mm -hmm. toss things in as well. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That's a great little, that's a great little end game piece to be able to fit a couple in, especially if your alliance partner also has the ability to uh, park in a small section as well. Yeah. It's certainly a lot easier than having to lift something up. I think that's really creative to then be able to fine tune it with having some wheels on as well. Do you, uh, now that it's got it powered up, can we see that spin dexter rotating yeah. around as it goes to? So I'll turn it around to see the intake. So, okay. yeah. So, first, when we intake it, We'll take all three balls and automatically move to the next chamber. And then... <laughs> and then here you can see the transfer. Mm -hmm. So when I... So right now, like, when I press it, it'll... If I want to shoot a green and I press A on the controller, it'll shoot a green one. And... Oh, but it can't find a April tag right now, so it's not actually firing. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, right, right. things are in demo. It's a little different because you probably have some ability where if the April tag's not being seen, you're not actually able to fire, so you don't fire into the crowd, kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So that is, you know, a purple, purple, and then uh, you also have that button that will also fire all three all at once. But yeah, yeah we can show you that. No, sure. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> that's a good amount of throughput going through that thing as well really really slick design super slick last question for you what are you most proud of about this robot i would probably say i really like the way that we we sort the balls i love like, how the mechanism works like in like overall i specifically like the up and down part of it because that like allows this like like it's allows for easier transfer from intake to outtake and i think that that's like probably the most creative part of our robot too because i've seen a lot of spindexers but none of them move like up and down like ours yeah it's super creative to have some the whole thing that lifts up and down and rotates to then be able to transfer it in it allows you to get a lot more compact because how compact is your robot in its width wise are you at 18? Yes. Yeah, we're, we're a little bit less, but pretty okay. much right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, still pretty good to be able to fit all that into one packaging because, man, that's, that is a tough challenge this season to be able to fit everything into a small package. Mm -hmm. Very tough challenge. Cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I think it's super cool what you girls have done, and I love that Spindexer, and there's, not, there's lots of just little interesting things. Uh, and I wish you the best of luck out there this season. Thank you. Thank you.